Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope you enjoyed lunch and that you also had some uh, time to look at the posters and to interact with uh, the other people uh, present because that's a uh, very good beneficial of being here real in real life. Uh, for those who just uh, joined this uh, TU Metech dag, within the Center for Care and Cure we have the tradition to uh, when we have uh, speakers in our bi-monthly science cafe to open with a science quiz. And we decided to also start off uh, each session with a pop quiz. So uh, again, please pick up your phone and uh, go to menti.com. And uh, yeah, the co most of you still have the code uh, in their screens, but the code for today is 4179. 9139. Everybody ready? I see still people uh, trying uh, to connect. Uh, so, the first question of uh, the pub quiz of this final session of today. Um, is uh, about ultrasounds. Certain ultrasound machines are capable of Doppler ultrasound, a special ultrasound technique that evaluates blood flow through a blood vessel, including the patient's major arteries and vein. Which of the following is not a type of Doppler ultrasound? Is it A, color Doppler, B, phase Doppler, C, power Doppler, or D, spectral Doppler? Uh, for those who just joined, I only give you the answers. If you take the answer in doubt or you have more questions, please ask them to the speakers. Uh, I see uh, uh, A is in favorite. Unfortunately, this is wrong. The right answer was face Doppler. And Massimo Michi, our first speaker of this session, can tell you everything about this. Our second question, do you recognize the person in the machine? Uh, the company Sensius, uh, our speaker from industry today, develops the Focus Color, a commercial solution based on Martin's design of the Hypercolor 3D. How many independently controlled antennas will the Focus Color provide? Is it 4, B12, C20, or D, 48 antennas. There's quite some discussion uh, about 20, 48. I think we all agree it's not four. So, uh, and the right answer is C, 20. Unfortunately, uh, our speaker of Sensius is not here today, but our moderator, Gerard van Roon, uh, will step in for him, so uh, he probably can also explain why it's 20. Uh, and our final question of this pub quiz. When treatment side effects become a problem during radiation therapy, which of the following solutions is usually offered by the doctor? A. Switch the patient to chemotherapy. B, interrupt radiation therapy for a week to see if the symptoms go away and then resume with radiation therapy. C, treat the symptoms when they present and then maintain the schedule of re uh, radiation therapy. And D, change the time of the day when radiation therapy is given. Oh, now we have experts again. So. And indeed, the correct answer is C. And we will uh, hear more about radiation therapy by Professor Remy Nout from the Erasmus University during his talk. Um, this was the last pop quiz of today, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did uh, by composing this pop quiz. Uh, I will now quickly... Uh, give the floor to the moderators of this session as we really have to finish at three o'clock because then this room will be uh, arranged so that Maarten can have his inaugural lecture. I would like to give the floor to the moderators of this final session of today, Gerard van Roon and Svon van der Sommer. Yes. 
is it uh, working? Uh, welcome everybody to the session. Uh, nice to see that there's uh, such a big audience. I think we uh, have a, an excellent uh, set of talks in this session. Um, the first talk will be from uh, Professor Massimo Mishi from the Department of Electrical Engineering uh, from the capacity group that I'm myself um, as well, from Signal Processing System. Uh, Massimo has a broad line of research uh, focusing on, uh, on different imaging modalities from ultrasound to MRI to electrophysiology with a focus on understanding the full measurement chain. Um, and if you've ever visited Massimo's office, you know that besides his uh, excellent knowledge on science, he also has a very good taste of uh, football. Um, but uh, yeah, I heard that his team just uh, made the conference league, so congratulations on that as well, uh, Massimo. Massimo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks uh, for the invitation. I'm, uh, it's a really great pleasure to share with you our experience developed over, over the years on multiparametric ultrasound and machine learning. Uh, today we are working, in fact, on several uh, applications uh, of that. We are uh, working on uh, uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, we are working on uh, uterine cancer, uh, breast cancer. But let's say at the beginning of this uh, journey, I was confronted with a question on uh, well, which was uh, really a, an application in, in great need for imaging technology that could also actually help. You know, in the beginning of this uh, of a research trajectory, you need funding, so that could also help in showing the impact of such a research. So this is a journey that, I've, in fact, I, I made together, uh, tightly together with clinical partners. First of all, the Academic Medical uh, Center, so now there I should say, uh, Amsterdam University Medical Center, at that time was the IMC in the beginning, uh, but also the Martini Clinic in Hamburg, a leading center in Europe, and, uh, and also in China, the second affiliated hospital, Zhejiang University. So, asking the question, what was the application in strong need for uh, innovation and imaging, new imaging modalities. Well, that was prostate cancer. It's the, uh, well, it's the number one uh, type of cancer in terms of incidence and, and the second for mortality in men. Uh, so in strong need for uh, diagnostic uh, solutions that could also, uh, in fact, support uh, novel treatment and focal treatment, which is actually available. But still, today, because of the limitations of the imaging technology, uh, diagnostics is based on systematic biopsy. So taking 12 to 18 tissue samples from the prostate, uh, spread over space, this is, of course, an invasive procedure. Uh, the sensitivity is not extremely high because of the fact that you are sampling in space, so you don't cover the full prostate. Uh, and also, in retrospect, because of the poor stratification of patients based on the blood test, which is the PSA, then uh, what happens is that three out of four patients undergo, uh, in retrospect, uh, unnecessary uh, biopsies, also with all the stress that comes with that. Well, nowadays we have some uh, imaging uh, technology that has developed quite, has been developed quite far and made it also to the guidelines for imaging pre-biopsy. And this is based on a number of uh, uh, large trials. Uh, this is MRI, so multi-parametric MRI, combining different uh, MRI uh, modalities. However, if you look at it a bit more carefully uh, at the data, you realize that there is a large number of false positives who, who still receive unnecessary biopsies, but also clinically significant prostate cancer, so the one that has a high chance of developing a metastasis, uh, is also still missed. Not to mention the poor uh, reproducibility, especially in centers that are not expert centers. So you need really an expert center to be able to reach uh, uh, accurate results. And, uh, of course, we know also the limitations in, in relation to MRI. It's a, an expensive uh, solution, and uh, the availability is not, is not that, uh, that wide. Of course, this is perhaps not such a problem in this country, but certainly in other countries. So a possible alternative to MRI that is more widely uh, available and more cost-effective is ultrasound. Uh, what is the status of ultrasound nowadays, and which are the developments? 
Well, we have shear wave elastography. This is a technology that's been developed in the past years, thanks also to the development of ultra-fast ultrasound, where you can uh, create, generate a shear wave propagating over tissue by using a radiation force. And then if you track this shear wave and you estimate the velocity, that relates to the young modulus of tissue. That means you can estimate the stiffness of tissue. And cancer is stiffer than benign tissue. So that helps with the diagnosis, as you see here, some, some of the results. Another possibility is uh, micro-ultrasound. So if you uh, drive your probe at very high frequencies, then you can resolve very tiny details and generate very high uh, resolution images, which also help in the diagnosis of prostate cancer. And next to that is what we have mostly developed. It's based on contrast-enhanced ultrasound, looking at the dispersion of contrast agents. So in fact, in, in the beginning of, of this journey, uh, thinking of the use of contrast enhanced ultrasound, so I would like to focus, in fact, on this application, uh, we targeted the um, association between angiogenesis, or the development of this uh, chaotic, uh, irregular network of microvessels that feed the tumor, <coughs> and the tumor needs it to grow beyond a few millimeters in size, uh, we wanted to be able to detect the presence of angiogenesis, which is, then would be a very strong biomarker for cancer. Well, this is uh, supported, in fact, by a lot of literature. It's also true for prostate cancer. But, uh, well, the difficulty is, is that we should be able to resolve this microvascular architecture. In particular, we wanted to really to look not just at perfusion, but really try to infer which is the underlying microvascular architecture. So this, uh, that helps us really recognize in these angiogenic networks. This uh, received quite some funding. We were able to develop our research. and. Uh, the basis of these are ultrasound contrast agents. Just to quickly tell you what that is, these are microbubbles that are injected in blood. Once they are insonified by ultrasound, they will start oscillating in a way that you can actually uh, very nicely detect it with ultrasound because they oscillate in a nonlinear fashion. And now what we do is to inject intravenously bolus of ultrasound contrast agents. So you see here the process that is filled by that, these microbubbles. We extract the concentration, the evolution of the concentration of microbubbles over time at, uh, and over space, so for each pixel. And then we developed our spatial temporal analysis. This is based on a convective dispersion modeling of these microbubbles. And the idea is to extract parameters that relate to the dispersion of microbubbles in space. As, as you can imagine, this can, um, in fact, reflect the underlying microvascular architecture, which we don't see, but we can infer it by spatial temporal analysis of the evolution of the concentration in time and space. And we developed several estimators, in fact, for dispersion over the years. And here you, s you can see some of, some of the results by 2D ultrasound, you see how nicely actually these dispersion maps um, in fact agree with the result of, uh, of the histology after radical prostatectomy. Well, the next study, important study, was to be able to target biopsies based on our images. So we did that in 142 patients at the um, at Amsterdam UMC. So this was a quite uh, large study. And well, here are the results. You don't, don't have to look at all the numbers. What is important is that we compared our results to multiparametric MRI. And the detection rate, as you can see, was pretty comparable. So we detected uh, 40 patients uh, against 41 patients. So rather comparable if you think of the difference. And this is only one parameter. It's only based on dispersion. Uh, uh, well, uh, in general, what we observe is that, yes, the detection rate is good, it's similar to multiparametric MRI, but biopsies, systematic biopsies, did still a way better. So there is room for improvement. And it was back in 2015 that we uh, wrote this systematic review of all the possibilities that are given by ultrasound. And in fact, the major benefit that we could achieve when we could combine all this information, this complementary information, in order to boost our diagnosis. And we did the first study in collaboration with the Martini Clinic, where indeed we uh, measured not only contrast, but also the elasticity of tissue, the standard gray level remote images, and combined all this information by a machine learning framework in order to see whether we could boost the diagnostic accuracy. And you can see that for clinically significant prostate cancer, we achieved quite a high uh, receiver operating characteristic curve area. So this was very promising results. And 
what helped also achieving these results is being able by AI, so here we developed a deep uh, network in order to segment the prostate also in the zones, because different zones in the prostate have different type of tissue, and that knowing that and informing the machine learning framework about this helps a lot with the classification. Then the next step was to go towards 3D. You can imagine, in 2D, if you want to measure the indicator dilution curves, then you look at the wash in and wash out of the contrast at each peak. So you can do it plane by plane. So to cover the full prostate, you need several planes and several injections. It takes a huge amount of time. So it's not feasible in a clinical workflow. But if you can scan it, 3D, then you just inject the bolus and you analyze the full process in one go. So that's why we moved into this direction. Uh, of course, also our models are by nature 3D models, though also helps in terms of modeling. Here you see some results of our dispersion uh, analysis compared to the histology, and we develop this even further by uh, developing some tractographic techniques to reconstruct the main streams of flow. So also these images show, in fact, quite a good agreement with the histological result. So with this technology, what we did was to uh, develop uh, even further into, a, let's say, a multi-parametric approach, but then just focused, focusing first on ultrasound contrast agents. So we looked at dispersion parameters, that is what we developed, together with the standard perfusion parameters, combining all together, and we achieved with the, uh, in a machine learning framework, again, uh, quite uh, nice results, even in 3D, even with these low volume rates, you can imagine ultrasound in 3D is a bit slower than in 2D, still we could achieve a 0.81 area under the receiver operating curve, which was very promising results. In this case, what we did was to try to predict the results of biopsies. So these were not patients referred for radical prostatectomy as before, but these are patients that just, uh, we say, uh, naive patients in the sense that they still, uh, they don't know yet whether they have cancer. So, and then they will, they receive biopsies to confirm. The next step was to develop in the direction of a full multi-parametric ultrasound approach where we also included B-mode and uh, elastographic information. And this was done uh, still again in collaboration with a, a second affiliate hospital at Zhejiang University. Uh, you see here uh, the, the results. Uh, well, here you see the approach basically based on the B-mode features and the elastographic features. We had to use still two different scanners at that time. Now it's being all implemented in the same scanner, in fact. And the results, uh, after uh, combi uh, combining all these parameters in the machine learning framework, we used in this case uh, gradient boost, then uh, were pretty promising. You see that by well, already our CUDI analysis was performing very well, again confirming our previous results with a 0 0.81 uh, area under the receiver characteristic curve, operating characteristic curve. Shear waves are not that excellent, but once they com are combined with our CUDI analysis, we could boost our classification performance even further, uh, actually to a 0 0.85, which is a very, uh, very good result, especially when we are trying to reproduce biopsies, which is not really a perfect ground through. So to conclude, I think, um, well, you have seen the potential of the dispersion imaging approach, the fact that uh, expanding that to a 3D approach actually brings uh, great advantages, especially for the clinical application. It should be multi-parametric because cancer is such a complex uh, process that you need to use complementary parameters to help your diagnosis. And, uh, and of course, more extensive validation is strongly needed and is ongoing. So we got an NIH grant now, so in collaboration with uh, Thomas Jefferson University, we are also uh, developing even further this technology, especially on the, on the validation. And I think something that I would mention and, and that fits very well in this meeting is uh, that, well, you could never deploy such a, such a technique uh, to the clinic unless you had uh, industrial partners that are really implementing these solutions. So what we did, in fact, is that we are, I was quite successful with a, with a proof of concept uh, from the ERC grant, and then we have a takeoff grant, and this year we received also an uh, EIC transition grant. So all together helped a lot in the formation and the foundation of a uh, startup company that is now doing pretty well and is filling the gap between research and, and, and clinical translation. For instance, the uh, low-level implementation of our 
or our code, which is extremely necessary if you want really to deploy it to the clinic and therefore to patients. And also this, this company is now supporting very large clinical trials that will create that evidence that we need again to uh, complete the clinical translation of these uh, technologies. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention and I'd like to thank especially uh, Professor Baxter, that was my partner in all this, uh, this journey, but also, of course, uh, Professor Pintong and George Salomon from the other partners, hospitals, and in particular, all the students that uh, supported and contributed to the developments that we made over the years. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Massimo, for the nice talk. Uh, I think we have time for one or two questions uh, before we continue. Um, are there any questions from the audience for Massimo? Um, not. Oh, yes, please. So, sorry, if it would be applicable to other areas oh, of the yes, body? Oh, yes, absolutely. So, uh, as I started, we are now actually <laughs> working on different types of cancer, uh, like pancreas, uh, uterus, breast cancer. And uh, so, this technology is now being experimented also for, uh, for other cancers. Be this is because angiogenesis ac is actually supporting the growth of solid tumors a, a bit in our organs. So, it's a, it's a common process, though the features are different. So, we have to learn that. Thanks. Maybe one, one more question? Yes? In, in your picture, it looked for the prostate, it looked like there was less signal coming back from the far end of the, uh, of the sensor, of the, of, of the ultrasound sensor. Is that a problem or did you take care of, can you take care of that? You can take care of that uh, to a certain extent. So if you are uh, beyond the urethra, you will uh, face a lot of attenuation of ultrasound. So the area that is beyond the urethra in the transition zone uh, is a bit less visible. Uh, on the other hand, 80% of tumors develop in the uh, peripheral zone, which is close by. So it's, it can be a problem, but it's not that common that, that you have developed tumor on, on that side. Okay, thanks. Then let's thank our speaker again. And then it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Remy Naut. He is uh, head of the Department of Radiotherapy at Erasmus MC. And as a radiation oncologist, his passion is to improve radiotherapy, be it technical or biological, uh, to improve radiotherapy for uh, 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 treatment outcome and, most importantly, also quality of life. Um, his personal research is uh, focused on, on brachytherapy in cervical cancer uh, to increase, increase uh, local control. And he is part of that. He is uh, also uh, a leader uh, of the international uh, uh, phase three trials. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Gerard. And um, uh, thank you, Maarten, also for uh, uh, bringing me here to, uh, to this very nice symposium. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, today I will uh, try to explain something about uh, the work we are doing which is much uh, more uh, at the beginning compared to the previous speaker uh, of, uh, of, of such uh, research and, uh, and development uh, track. Uh, so this is about personalization of uh, brachytherapy applica applicated for cervical cancer and I can imagine that that is uh, not something that um, um, the audience is very familiar with. So I try to give a first a more general introduction. And in the Netherlands, we only see approximately 800, 900 cervical patients, new patients a year. Um, but f from the worldwide perspective, this is one of the most uh, uh, common leading causes of female cancer death. Uh, what's also important to realize is that um, the age at diagnosis is uh, around uh, 30 to 44 years is the peak. So this affects uh, women in a period of their life that, they, um, uh, that the treatment uh, and diagnosis has a lot of impact also from the soci socio-economical uh, perspective. So that's important to realize. Um, Approximately half of the patients have what we call a locally advanced cancer. And uh, the standard treatment is a combination of external beam radiotherapy, uh, which is given uh, daily during approximately five weeks. And uh, with that, each week, there's also a cycle of chemotherapy. And at the end, 
we give a treatment that's called brachytherapy. So the first part daily is external beam radiotherapy, and uh, then at the end we have a treatment that's called brachytherapy from brachy nearby, and that's where we give treatment using uh, radioactive sources that are positioned close by or uh, in, in the tumor. Um, so here you see an example of a patient with a locally advanced cervical cancer at time of diagnosis, and I marked the, the tumor for you. And after external beam, you see that already a, a lot has changed. And this is an example of a patient with a good responding uh, cancer, and you see that there's enormous volume reduction. And uh, that's, of course, very important to take into account how a tumor also responds uh, during treatment. Um, Brachytherapy, I just explained, is given uh, uh, very nearby or in the tumor. Um, we use applicators, and here you see an example of an applicator. Uh, and these are hollow tubes, and uh, they, these are combined with what we call interstitial needles. And in these needles and in these hollow tubes, we can position a radioactive source on a, on a guide wire. Um, when I started my residency, which is not so long ago, um, <coughs> We did not use uh, MRI um, or the information of MRI to give this treatment, um, and we uh, only had X-ray to guide our, uh, our treatment. And uh, at that moment, everyone got the same treatment, and uh, that was uh, a very standardized uh, plan. Here you see a treatment plan, and these are what we call isodose lines of the brachytherapy dose. And the red line is supposed to go around this red area, which is in this case a uh, not so well responding tumor, um, where you see that the treatment that we used to give did not cover the tumor here. Um, over the last two decades we have seen large improvements due to the introduction of uh, MRI in the diagnostics, uh, but also in the treatment in, in our field, in, in radiotherapy. And here you see then an example of how we treat at the moment, where we use MRI with an applicator in place, and where we also use a combination of what we call intracavitary, but also the interstitial components of an applicator to really shape the dose around the area where you want to have it and also spare normal healthy tissue, um, which you also see here. Um, <clears throat> Using MRI-guided treatments, we have recently um, uh, demonstrated with long-term follow-up in a European collaborative study that we can achieve excellent uh, outcomes. On the right, you see uh, local control rates in tumors that are advanced stage, stage 3, 4, which is excellent, around 90%. And also, the overall survival is now really much better than uh, uh, one, two decades, uh, decades ago. But are we already there? I would say no, and it's a little bit in the small letters below, because what's really important, we can achieve really good outcome now, but we still have quite some side effects of treatment. And here we see severe side effects, that's a system for grading, and you see that approximately a quarter of the patients still uh, suffers also severe uh, uh, side effects which really impact on quality of life. And I just explained these are, in, on average, uh, 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 patients that are in a stage of life that it really has impact also on uh, their family life and society. So there's room for improvement. And um, one of the areas that, uh, that we think can uh, have an impact is, uh, is the way we currently uh, um, use our applicators. There are limitations. And this is an illustration to show that with a very advanced commercial available applicator, we still have problems. Um, and what we see is that an applicator has fixed positions and fixed geometry. Um, and uh, with that fixed geometry, you have limitations. So you cannot treat everywhere how you would want to treat. So this is a coverage problem. But also, um, uh, doing your best, you still also treat parts of healthy tissue with an unwanted high dose, which also gives increased risk of, uh, of side effects. Um, that's not the only, the only uh, point. Uh, this is a bit of a complicated slide. It's a PhD student of our department who has just recently done what we call then a time action analysis of the whole treatment procedure. And 
uh, for us, on average, we have then four patients who undergo treatment on one day. And these are the different steps. And you can see that it's quite a complicated chaos in the department to treat these four patients on one day. And they have to go from the OR to the MRI to another room. And there are all kinds of steps in between that also uh, are related to certain limitations in the whole um, system. Uh, and here, to illustrate uh, that, you see uh, the, the time. And on average, it can be around nine hours from when the patient enters the hospital the, till the patient uh, is discharged. And especially these steps in between are also related to, to the applicator, both the insertion and also the, the, uh, the applicator removal before discharge. So it's really important to realize all these different aspects and all the logistics in the department that can be quite complex um, when you want to change something. Not only the time is important, but also, of course, the patient experience. And um, we um, uh, have uh, yeah, surveyed in, in, in around 100 patients uh, patient experience in asking different uh, important aspects on pain, anxiety, and uh, uh, the, the observed uh, yeah, duration. Um, and it's uh, very good to realize um, uh, what, what, what happens with the patient during such a whole treatment procedure. And also which steps, and for instance, in this case, you see that when the day passes, there is an increase also in pain and related anxiety, and especially at, towards the end, this also plays an important role. So these are all factors to, to take into account. Um, uh, already uh, some years ago, um, um, we developed a concept uh, to look uh, if we could um, uh, make what we call them personalized applicators. So why not... Uh, change this whole concept and uh, use this imaging information that we have to really design a patient-specific applicator, taking into account uh, also the anatomy of that individual patient. And uh, this is the first uh, um, uh, yeah, actual uh, device we made uh, in a very simple way, where we filled the vaginal cavity with uh, ultrasound gel during the MRI. And we used that shape uh, to design a 3D printed applicator and we made uh, yeah, patient-specific um, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, spaces to position the interstitial uh, needles in. Um, so um, that was the onset for us to, uh, to, to start a project which we call the Architect uh, Project, in uh, which the goal is at the end to uh, make these 3D printed applicators uh, in, in a more... Um, um, yeah, uh, I would say a more robust uh, uh, way, um, where um, um, we also use the 3D information from the MRI to more optimally space these uh, needles. And the procedure that we follow is that we use the MRI, we contour the, the areas, uh, we have to delineate that, and then um, uh, we use the surface design to make the, the model. But what's important also is um, how we position these, uh, these needles in, uh, in space. Um, so another PhD student started uh, working on this. And um, as part of his thesis, he used different methods to uh, explore how to... Um, um, uh, how to plan these needle trajectories. Um, and uh, when you uh, start with such a project, um, uh, for me, as a clinician, it, is, it has been really crucial to collaborate with a technical university and to uh, learn from, uh, from the technical university side all uh, these, um, yeah, these different aspects. And the challenge here is not only to, um, uh, to, to make something that can uh, overcome um, uh, more geometric um, uh, obstacles, uh, but also to take into account uh, dosimetric uh, aspects from, uh, from radiation. So it's a combination of different fields that have to come to bed together in order to optimize such a, such a problem. And in the thesis, this was done in, in, in a, two day, a 2D sorry, um, uh, way, but we are now making uh, uh, this software to do that automatic in, in 3D. 
Another aspect um, uh, that we also looked at, here you see an example of, uh, of such a, a source on a guide wire, a radioactive source that goes through a, 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 ring, a standard ring applicator. And uh, what's very important is uh, yeah, the limitations of such uh, guide, wire, uh, guide wires inside, uh, inside hollow tubes. And uh, even deviations of around one, two millimeters can have quite some effect uh, given the strong dose gradients that we, that we have. Um, and uh, the problem or one of the uh, challenges uh, with a personalized applicator is that also each applicator will have a different uh, positioning of these uh, hollow tubes. So in order to, um, uh, to, to do this and uh, to design this in a good way, we investigated if we can also um, uh, simulate this uh, based on um, information uh, of the guide wires. Um, um, and uh, what, we, what we then did uh, was uh, use data to simulate that. Uh, and this is the work that has just also been uh, been presented at our at our conference. And what you can see is if you know information on friction and forces uh, of of these uh, these cables in in such uh, hollow spaces, you can actually use this information to simulate this in a very uh, very good uh, way. So to summarize. Um, I, I think in this field where, where we're working, there's plenty of uh, opportunities, in this case, to decrease side effects and treatment burden and to improve tumor control. And uh, I think we just saw some examples where it's really crucial that we have a good collaboration with partners in academia, in our case, a medical hospital with a universe, technical university, but also with industry. Um, uh, and I think that is really crucial. We also have quite some challenges, and I think you have already discussed MDR uh, today, but also in the, from the clinical perspective, logistics, time pass, clinical studies, it's not easy to get everything together at the right moment. Um, and we just saw uh, some, some first, um, let's say, technical challenges that we are encountering on this project, uh, such as uh, source path planning, um, and, and brachytherapy workflow and all that is needed for such an applicator where you have a very short period in time to design and produce such a device. And we didn't touch material and printing, but all kinds of aspects come together in, uh, in such a project. That um, is almost my last slide, Gerard. I just want to acknowledge uh, everyone that, uh, that is uh, also collaborating on this project. And also briefly just want to uh, thank Martin specifically, uh, because Martin has been working at our department already for many uh, years, and we have had a very successful collaboration. Uh, so I just want to thank Martin specifically now also for all these years of, uh, of, of good collaboration with our department and uh, we look forward to collaborating further in, uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And Amy, for a very interesting talk and also pointing out a number of uh, challenges. Huh? Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Oh, we have this uh, yeah, throw, he can catch it. Thank you. So I'm very happy to see that hyperthermia is now regularly used uh, in this clinical practice. Uh, my question is, uh, for the brachytherapy, are you also combining that with hyperthermia or not? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I, um, so uh, classically, hyperthermia is, is given uh, as a separate treatment, uh, usually during external beam, and it's given on a weekly uh, basis. Um, Gerard is, uh, uh, has, has a project at our department where we have actually designed uh, these needles um, uh, to be able to also, if you have, uh, let's say, several needles, uh, then you can also use that as antennas to, to, to perform hypothermia. Uh, so this is really, uh, I would say, but Gerard can talk more about that in, at, at the moment in the preclinical, uh, but, well, near to uh, going to clinical uh, uh, steps, I would say. Um, but this is uh, not done in routine clinic yet. Okay. So we go over guard, uh, we're going to test it. Yeah. 
But I think it's interesting, especially for instance in uh, in, in recurrent uh, uh, tumors. Um, yeah. Yep. Any more questions? If if not, and, and there is still time, uh, I, I would like to ask a question myself okay. because we have been discussing uh, uh, a lot about evidence based. There, eh? I mean the, the yeah. whole. Uh, clinical uh, um, decisions are made on evidence-based uh, systems. You showed very nicely response rates of 75% or higher. Mm -hmm. I think 75% was even on the lower side. Uh, if you're going to improve your system, mm -hmm. uh, would your focus be on reduced toxicity? I think you also indicated that. Or improved control? Um, I think to... Um, um, so, I, I, it's a really good question. Um, there are two aspects, I think. Um, but if w what I just showed is indeed that at the moment we already have quite good uh, results, and the focus should really be on decreasing uh, morbidity. morbidity. Um, and I think uh, that is also um, yeah, the, the benefit that we can more easily uh, actually demonstrate. Um, but uh, there are also a lot of challenges in clinical trials in uh, demonstrating benefits in, in morbidity. But we have also very good examples where benefits in morbidity have been dem demonstrated in clinical trials, uh, also leading to pressing changing uh, 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 results. Um, yeah. 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 I think I, I think that's nice. But also for the audience. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Please, we, we can continue this discussion later also in oh, the... Yeah. Uh, Regarding the morbidity, I think uh, morbidity is also a personal experience. So each patient reacts differently on chemotherapy or on another treatment and also how they experience the severity of their therapy. So how is it... Can you adapt that in a, like a sort of a personalized treatment to lower down personalized experienced morbidity maybe, uh, so uh, yeah maybe um, uh, so two things um, uh, we we also use um, uh, patient reported outcomes to uh, to measure uh, observed um, yeah, morbidity uh, side effects um, and of course it's challenging on an individual basis to um, to let's say have a solid uh, let's say evidence based decision making on a, on a very individualized basis, basis. But what is important, I think, is to use these uh, patient reported outcomes also to inform patients in a good as possible manner about what they can expect. And of course, these are averages uh, over um, um, yeah, many patients. And you're right, uh, we also know from patient reported outcome studies that uh, personality, uh, for instance, there, there are all types of aspects that affect uh, how, how people observe uh, um, uh, their treatment and side effects. So there's always a challenge of having evidence from a population and translating it into uh, into an individual, uh, um, uh, yeah, individualized uh, aspect. I, yeah, I think there's still, there's, I think there's still time. Because yes, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Jan Dijkendijk is sitting here. He's yeah. the proponent for MR Linux. Yeah. How do you see the relation between, let's say, your treatment yeah. and the MR Linux? How, how does that go in the future? What do you think? Um, so, yeah, I think that um, uh, at the moment, um, uh, I would say with brachytherapy, we are still able to, um, yeah, to give, a, a, at the moment, a, uh, a steeper dose gradient, um, uh, which has some intrinsic benefit over what we can achieve um, uh, with an external uh, uh, linear accelerator. Um, Jan might disagree, but that's my opinion. Uh, <laughs> and there are certain challenges, uh, on, I think, on both sides. Um, and one of the advantages of brachytherapy is that such an applicator is very fixed inside the, the, uh, the target area. Uh, and with an external um, uh, device, you still have a lot of, or a lot, there is certain uncertainty um, uh, with regard to uh, exact positioning. Of course, on both sides, there are limitations and benefits. 
Um, uh, but at the moment, if you look at the evidence that we have, there's a clear evidence that, um, that there is an overall survival advantage of brachytherapy compared to external beam radiotherapy. Of course, you can also argue that most of that data is not done on an MR LINAC. Um, so I think we will see in the future uh, how, this, um, how this pans out. Yeah. And, and combination of the two? Well, um, uh, that's also a very interesting, um, I think, um, uh, way to, to think. Um, uh, but um, uh, at the moment, uh, we still use quite a fractionated schedule uh, over time. Um, so there are some, let's say, logistical challenges. Um, if you would really hyperfractionate your first part of external beam radiotherapy, uh, then I think there would be, um, uh, probably it would be more practical. Uh, but I think Jan would be able to say much more about that. Um, but I can imagine that having these patients coming five days a week on uh, such a machine for five weeks, yeah, it depends on how many patients you treat, but in our situation, we would need a lot of machines. But luckily also, uh, that was not the topic, uh, MR Linux of this, uh, this, this, this talk. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we, we, we <laughs> delay that discussion till, uh, till later after the coffee uh, or in the coffee break. And, uh, and then we will continue. We'll see. Thank you so far for your you. great presentation. And, um, and we continue uh, with the, the next presentation. And uh, yeah. Now I, I, I should have to introduce myself because unfortunately uh, the speaker, the original speaker, Paul van der Biegeler, is not able to uh, to be here. He, uh, I, I think I can disclose that he tested positively uh, this morning, and he said I will come. But uh, uh, I said no, no, for the, the protection of the audience, we rather have you to stay uh, home, and it was not pe not uh, feasible to to uh, do it uh, in uh, in teams. So I have volunteered to. Uh, give his presentation, but you have to forgive me that uh, that I didn't uh, know upfront what his talk would be. So I have to look to uh, to the written uh, uh, presentation, and uh, and I will do it as good as uh, as possible. I cannot answer for him, but you're still free to to to, to bring up uh, questions later on, and I will try to answer them also as good as I can. But that's that's it. Or if you say uh, you want to have coffee earlier, 15 minutes, <laughs> that's also an option, of course. So, but let me start with introducing uh, Paul van der Bigelaar. He uh, has been an executive, or, or he has uh, more than uh, uh, 30 years of experience in high tech uh, medicine, of which 15 years as an executive. And uh, his latest experience was with Nucleotron, the company that uh, that uh, uh, sold, a, a, a Dutch famous company that sold the brachytherapy devices uh, uh, and was a world leader, is now with Electa. And currently, uh, Paul van der Bigelaar is the chief executive officer of uh, Sensius BV, our startup company aiming at introducing a breakthrough technology for thermometer. Uh, for thermotherapy, and uh, this is the, the device. No, no, because I see one further than you. So you see the device here on uh, on your screen. This is uh, the new device of uh, the head and neck hypothermia. And uh, companies, as his, his, his title is, companies. Where is it here? Companies on and clinical research is it a marriage of love? And um, um, yeah, his aim was today to talk uh, to you about the relationship between companies and clinical research. And it's not always a harmonious uh, marriage, as we know. Uh, let's see why and if it can be done differently. So, the first slide already. The I have to, 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 to keep uh, looking to there. So, um, on this MedTech day, day, we speak about medical technology development. It always starts with a physician uh, with an unmet need and uh, a situation in his or her practice that needs improvement. Either the physician invents that improvement himself. What's happening now? Yeah. Or he turns to a technical researcher who provides him with a solution because that is what engineers are about, finding solutions. 
it is also it also happens in the other direction. In either case, there is a need and a solution that meets to that meet to start a true development. So are you developing, as, as an engineer, you can develop uh, a system and then try to find a disease, or in this case, I think that's also what he wants to say, is do you have a, a real clinical need and do you find a solution for that? And uh, of course, it's clear that uh, a device starting from a clinical need has a higher opportunity to, uh, to bring it to success than uh, vice versa. So the key, questions that you uh, put on a system is whether it's safe or it's effective. And uh, once this combination of problem and solution is made, there are a few key, key questions that come up. And everybody is aware of the risk of new technology. The first question is the safety, obvious, obviously, obviously immediately followed by the question of efficacy. If either one of these questions is negative, it's a definitive, definitively a no-go. The design goes in the bin and uh, you go back to the drawing board. But thanks to smart researchers, I have to, to, to see because sometimes I, I think I have, it says here click and I see nothing happening there. But let's see, yes, something happened, it's, it's very small. It's the yes. Thanks to smart researchers and engineers, as educated as, for instance, at the TU Eindhoven, many times the answer is positive. But is that enough? I would argue not at all. The whole concept of new solutions, of new solu solution to an unmet clinical need is absolutely worthless if it cannot reach patients all over the world. We hear, hear so much about great new discoveries made in a research clinic, but exclusive, exclusivity of such discovery for only patients treated at that clinic does not make this invention an innovation. The work of inventing physicians, researchers and engineers is of no value if it does not reach a large population of patients in need for such an invention. So if we can say yes, every time and reach patients worldwide, do we have an effective innovation? Have we contributed to the millennium goals of the United Nations to combat diseases? Wait a minute. Let's first evaluate how we can now, how we can now know this yes is truly a positive answer to the questions. There needs to be sufficient evidence that it is acceptable for the larger world, not only other physicians, but more importantly, patients, and also healthcare payers. Insurance companies and government authorities want to be convinced it is safe, effective, and should be provided to the patients worldwide at affordable cost. I think this is, this is, this is uh, uh, speaking for itself. You need to be... Uh, to have to fulfill all those criteria. Over time, the different parties that have a role in evaluating this yes have come up with a set of guidelines on how to evaluate efficacy and safety. Unfortunately, these are guidelines and it is not a set of fixed rules. So there is an ongoing argument about these steps. Particular, as you can see, there are not they are not too easy to implement. It takes a lot of patience to pass all tests. Questions of the impact of side effects versus the benefit of the treatment are not always easy to answer, specifically in oncology. Radiotherapy and chemotherapy are inherently toxic for patients, but still it is considered at this moment one of the best treatment modalities. Also, the comparison to standard treatment is not easy to make since standard treatment is constant, constantly evolving, and so by the time the evolution is finished, the standard of care has moved on. Uh, so, he didn't discuss the necessity of randomized trials. 
But uh, if you do normally a, a, a proof of efficacy, you start with a phase zero trial, you need a, little, a low amount of patients and you can decide whether the device is uh, that, that at low dose is, there is no harm. And, uh, and if you go to the next steps, side effects, side effects and efficacy, the number of patients that you need in your trial are increasing and you go from a single arm trial to a, 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 a randomized trial if you want to compare your treatments, your novel, your innovative treatment compared to the standard treatment. And uh, 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 more undefined is long-term benefits and side effects. Uh, they are often not, not uh, uh, randomized often also uh, uh, retrospective, but uh, overall it may not surprise you that literature shows that in medical technology 50% of all the evidence leads to a no. And that's there. High risk instead of a yes. For an academic setting the price of failure may unbearably high. Uh, so if you if you go all these steps, if you have you have only a step a, a chance a probability of one out of two that that you will pass these uh, these steps. So let's go back to our starting point: a physician with an unmet need and a technical researcher with a high potential technology. They are faced with creating creation of evidence that needs to be met high standards and with the high risk of failure, which is costly when this happens in the later stages of evidence-based. And if all evidence is provided, they still need to reach the larger world outside their own clinic of research institute. The starting point is evidently inadequate to achieve all of the goals of an innovation. Then comes the entrepreneur. If we want to accomplish something with medical technology improvements, entrepreneurs are key contributors in this process. His message to all researchers and clinicians gathered here today, make us part of your team to become truly effective. And I re realize this is easier said than done. And so, uh, yeah, we have heard this, this morning, a uh, cost of 100 million. Uh, for making uh, it to the clinic. Um, so you're facing really challenges if you want to bring your medical technological development to the, to the, to the patients. Where the dialogue between the physician and the technical researcher is not always easy, in the end, and they usually do come to an understanding of each other, both in their drive to create something new and solve an important problem. Such a dialogue is usually far more intensive when an entrepreneur is starting to invest his or her resources. Uh, so it's too expensive, scientifically not, in oh, not interesting, uh, or, <coughs> or in larger studies, studies, focus, speed and quality are our drivers. Stick to the protocol. This patient needs special attention, but sometimes this conflicts with attentions for the patients. Right? Sometimes you cannot include all your patients that you want, or you uh, have to to be more relaxed on the ex well. You have to be more relaxed on your exclusion criteria, and the scientific objective of researchers. It is not easy to make this an effective dialogue, let any let alone a happy marriage. So uh, I think. These are the, 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 the cons, and here you see reasons why we should um, uh, uh, relieve a little bit more on those, uh, uh, on those restrictions. And um, yeah, especially if you are in a niche, the number of patients are not that large, so you need to be, uh, to be uh, very uh, inventive, but also very strict on doing this. Now let's look at how it can be done differently by a live example, particularly relevant for the occasion. Our starting point was a physician with an unmet need and a te technical researcher with a high potential technology. So the physician is on the left. 
This physician was, at the, late, was the late Professor Levendag, head of the Daniel Den Hoek clinic, uh, clinic in Rotterdam. As a head and neck specialist with radiation oncology, he was struggling to find a better outcome for his patients. He was aware of the reputation of his institute, built... Now, now comes a, a, a sentence that is difficult for me to pronounce. Built on the work of me, today your moderator, in heating tumors. But for head and neck, he found it absolutely unacceptable to use this method. That's true. At that time, the state of the technology was to put in some energy and hope for the best, essentially blind heating. I always told, uh, mentioned it, um, dump and pray. So I, I responded to this challenge with this high technology, uh, with this high potential technology via phased array microwaves and image guidance. And um, yeah, then this person comes in that you see now, because um, yeah, by that time, 1982, I was made aware by Anton Tejaus, who is also here in the audience, that there was a smart master of science student just graduated, well, he, he was still doing his master, P, uh, master uh, thesis, uh, and, and based upon that master thesis, we were able to write a, a, a grant application with the Dutch Cancer Society, which was granted, and based upon that granted study, we uh, hired Martin to work uh, on uh, the head and neck uh, uh, applicator. And he aspired to build a device that was safe, effective, and Martin aspired to build a device that was safe, effective, and could benefit patients worldwide. And he also dared to go into the system himself. Uh, and what it is about, he will explain yourself by the movie. Now let's see whether this goes correctly. Steer the heat to the tumor while avoiding sensitive organs Will like I restart? eyes, brain, and spinal cord. The hypercoiler 3D consists of two semicircular shells which are placed around the tumor area. The shells contain 20 antennas to accurately focus the heat. In addition, we developed new software to adapt the treatment. Prior agreed treatment goals put positions in control. In this way, a novel clinical procedure ensures precise and consistent modeling for optimizing the heat delivery to the patient. So, now you know all about the technology, but then, uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, he could not, uh, uh, Paul van der Billen could not walk away from this invention, and with his partners, Peter van Paarsen, uh, me, and uh, also Martin, uh, we found that uh, Sentius, once Erasmus, wanted to grant us a license on the uh, IP and the technology. But then we realized we each could not go our own way after this first step. As soon as Sensius raised its first funding, we provided at several occasions research sponsorships to Erasmus, who was then capable of completing a first clinical study that contributed to the recognition of a yes in the set of key questions towards the ultimate goal. Therefore, it was obvious that it was obvious we as a company need to take the next step, which is both the sponsorship of a PhD student, as well as enabling Erasmus to bring their excellence outside Erasmus to all clinics who are eager to advance this development. So be a center of excellence and make uh, a European network. Eventually, Erasmus can take the lead in an international clinical study that will lead to broad adaptation Adoption of the work that started with an unmet need from a physician, a promising technology from a researcher, and a bright young man that made it happen. So the key takeaways are shown here. Um, and on the question of collaboration between research and companies, it is obvious they must work together. One cannot work without the other, but they need to recognize this ahead of uh, they need, but they need to, need to recognize this ahead of time in an open and transparent communication to make sure there is a mutual agreed objective regardless of the differences in the background. A second takeaway for us at Sensius is that Martin and the entire team at Erasmus MC have done an excellent job in their work at the Hypercolor and the Hypercolor 3D. And we look forward to extended to an extended period of intense collaboration to make this truly an important step forward for patients with head and neck cancer. 
thank you for your attention. So I'm, I'm sorry that I hesitated so here and there, but that was due to, to the lack of synchronization between the reading and the pictures. Any questions on, on this? Yeah, thank you uh, for, for doing this uh, <laughs> improvisive, uh, improvisation effort. Uh, thank you very much. I was wondering, how far is this product now on the market? Is it already in the market as a, a CE-approved product, or what's the status? Uh, that would have been great if we were that far, but that's not the case at this moment. So it's, uh, we are in the, in the process of acquiring the funds, and that is really looking uh, very promising mm -hmm. at this moment. And we are working with uh, uh, industry to, uh, to build the system and to make the first prototypes available within the next one and a half, two years. Okay, thanks. And based upon the current results, we already started uh, with the collaboration with Erasmus MSA. We are currently preparing with the prototype device a phase uh, 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 one study in primary cancer, uh, in patient with primary cancer. At this moment, we applied to the system with patients with recurrent uh, uh, cancer in, ir in, in previously irradiated areas, but the next step is then to go to primary patients. More questions? Otherwise, in view of time, it may be good to move to the panel discussion. Yeah. Yep. Um, Norge, will you advance the slides? So I'm now, now I'm not sure who I am. Eh? Am I <laughs> Paul van der Bigel or am I the moderator? <laughs> so one part is sitting there and one part is sitting here. So let's see. What we put down here is that the time for ID to product is currently very long. During this time, risk can emerge that render the final product suboptimal or even obsolete. Think about an adjusted medical standard or improved artificial intelligence um, technology, technique. So the question is, how can we expedite this process to ensure these valuable techniques to, do, to not succumb before reaching the finish line? I think this applies both yeah. for your <laughs> Diagnostic device, yeah. as, as it is for hypothermia. So, I, I would you like to respond? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, well, yeah, indeed, in our case, it took indeed uh, quite long to the time we, we are now, and which is not the end. Uh, started with, the idea was actually 2007, so you can imagine how long, how long it took. Uh, if you think in terms of yeah, how to speed up this process, I think one of the tips that was in the presentation you gave uh, on, on behalf, I think one, one is there, so to really um, well, build a partnership with, a, with an industrial partner uh, a bit earlier along the way. This is not always possible because um, if you have a very innovative uh, idea, uh, sometimes for, uh, for instance, for large companies, this, this may be complicated. That doesn't fit. So this long-term research, it will be long-term anyway. It doesn't fit maybe a, a shorter-term roadmap uh, in many cases. So in that case, uh, if that is the case, well, the solution could be maybe to try to join a bit later, uh, later in this process, or perhaps what we did is actually to try to establish a startup company that is actually taking care of all the other aspects that are not purely scientific aspects. And there are so many. And in particular, the gap that I experience in all our research, actually, that comes between the cause that we develop, well, we are at the signal processing systems group, uh, which are usually written at high level, and the code that is required for uh, an industrial implementation, which is typically low level. So who is yep. doing, generating this professional code? It's not something we can ask our PhD, so you really need an industrial partner for doing that. Yes. Maybe to follow up on that, so you work also a lot with AI, and 
So what, what I've seen is that sometimes uh, when, when you want to get clinical approval, even w if you work with industry, that can take up a couple of years even before you have gathered all the evidence that it's actually working. And that refers to uh, the, the part on AI, right? So maybe the techniques may change. Um, and then you don't, if you, for instance, have a better model, but a, 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 yeah, it's just doing a better job, but a, it's approximately the same, you don't want to start that trial all over again. Do you have any ideas to how we could like do that in a better way so that we can have always the best AI technique uh, available and not the one from five years ago? Yeah, I think there should be a framework in, in place where uh, you have an acceleration of innovation. Uh, and this, this applies to the MDR or to the, to the ethical approvals for the, for the studies, for, for everything. Uh, you have seen that we have often collaborated with uh, Chinese partners. So uh, they are in China. They, they, this, all this process is, is, in fact, much faster. Well, safety of patients is, of course, key and should be uh, actually the, 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 the leading point. But do we think that Chinese, uh, in China, for instance, safety is not so much taken into account? Well, well I, I doubt because I know how demanding are Chinese patients, for instance, yeah. compared even to Dutch patients. Yeah. So uh, I think it's really a matter of uh, finding a way to uh, accelerate the process and not start the process all over each time that you have a minor innovation. It should be a framework where you can add uh, innovation uh, to innovation in, in a faster way. I think some of the hospitals also in the Netherlands, especially for ethical approval, uh, they have some larger framework that, that, that comprise, uh, they comprise a large set of researches and, 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 and type of research that can actually fall under this uh, kind of agreement and uh, so as to have yeah. uh, approval but much faster but 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 they do uh, so in, in I, I also would like to to give uh, uh, Remy the opportunity to to say something and and but before I do so I also want to respond briefly on your comments is that if you you have to bring in a startup at the right time I think because we as census we noted that we were sometimes too large for the handkerchief, but too small for the yeah for the lark, uh, for the <laughs> sheet for the sheet. Eh? So we, we yeah. if you are what I want to say is that if you are within your uh, startup, if you are moving faster than what is available on the market at that time, you you are not received by either the initial the, the 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 investor at the very initial point. And you're not interesting for the one that is closer to the market. And that brings uh, also an additional challenge. And for that, I would like to, to, to go to Remy. Do you, have you, I mean, with your 3D printed, uh, I mean, it's a simple, the making it is relatively simple. Mm -hmm. Bringing, at, at least that's my idea, but maybe I'm wrong. So uh, how, did, how, is, how is that going with, 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 with your uh, uh, Innovation. Yeah, so maybe first uh, just one additional point, I think, to, to the previous discussion, because um, I think what we see now more and more, but I think we can still improve on that, is uh, uh, how we have open source uh, results and data available. Because I think that if you, um, if you store, uh, if you have a good uh, uh, access to stored uh, uh, previous results, um, that can be a way, at least, to access raw data and uh, with new methods, again, also uh, um, yeah, bring some form of acceleration. Of course, you cannot do everything, so certain steps, of course, you cannot uh, uh, reproduce uh, by looking at historical data, yes. but there's something in that. Um, and, and uh, Gerard, for, for your question, I think that... Um, well, we are in the lucky position uh, to collaborate in this case with an already established company. And I think in the Netherlands we can be quite lucky that we have uh, these grant opportunities, uh, for instance, from NWO, KWF, uh, with a public-private partnership um, that in a way also um, force, force you to of work with an established company because they need to uh, bring in uh, substantial funding. Um, and of course, having uh, the collaboration with an established company uh, is, is of great benefit in these steps because there is experience with bringing products to the market um, and a, a certain scrutiny from uh, the company per perspective that you also need. 
Um, so I think that is uh, that that's of course a benefit compared to starting up uh, a company in an in a novel uh, yeah. area. I think that's that's even more challenging. Yeah. So we have two two minutes. You go for the third, yeah, just the third question. Let's go for the next. Which one is yeah? Maybe maybe this is one that I am uh, especially interested yeah. in. Um, maybe it holds for both of you. It's not exclusively for AI research, but in AI research it, it occurs a lot now, right? Uh, we need a lot of patient data to f develop these models, and then we start out under the academic umbrella, and patients give their data for free, and we can do some research and show that actually sometimes AI can really help uh, drive clinical innovation and actually uh, make uh, doctors uh, allow them to make better prediction. But then if you if this will result in a spin-off, this technology is sold, and then of course the, the this hospitals have to pay for this, this ends up at the insurance and they have to raise their interest for the for the uh, for the actual customers, like the patients. So, um, yeah, we were wondering, uh, is the patient now paying double, both in data and in uh, increased uh, healthcare costs for, the, for these methods? And could we address that in some way? Well, in, in many cases, the fact that you uh, get some uh, innovative technology uh, reimbursed means that overall there is some saving, because it's very difficult to actually... Uh, bring to the market and implement in a clinic something that will cost more than what you pay now. So overall, there is a health technology assessment that, that is intended to show that your technology will lead to some savings. And, and still in healthcare costs have been increasing only, right? <laughs> that is true, for probably not so much because of innovation, but for many factors, I think, especially chronic diseases yeah. and, and uh, yeah, the, the, the increased age uh, sure. expectations. Uh, and all these factors contribute a lot. But I think innovation uh, and what we try to bring in is something that will actually allow saving uh, more rather than spending more. Yeah, so that's the, the, the story we can pitch to the patients that provide their data for free, that in the end, we, it leads to more efficient yeah. and better healthcare costs for the same price. I think so. Okay. You agree I, I, that? I would, I would um, add to that, I think that uh, we should not only Look, of course, we should look at costs, but it's not only about costs, it's about benefit to the patient. So for the patient perspective, it is uh, always about, let's say, giving data or helping research uh, for the motivation to help future patients. Um, uh, so uh, in, in, in that way, um, of course, I mean, it's a good point, uh, but I think that um, that that the balance has another factor, and that is, uh, of course, the incremental benefit if, if a new treatment or a new AI method is really bringing a better outcome, then it's, it, it's for generations uh, of, of benefit, which easily outweighs uh, uh, these aspects. I think that's a good point uh, to conclude yeah. with. Uh Right? Yes, thank you. Okay, then thanks all for your attention. We, I think we have a coffee break now, uh, Nortje, or not? Nope. Or we continue directly? <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs>
But uh, we do think, and I hope you are convinced as well now, that this is really important. I would sincerely like to thank the speakers, moderator, but also the poster presenters. Uh, I think they also presented very great work. And if you haven't seen, seen it yet, then please uh, go uh, when there is the, the hour breaker. Um, but I also would like to uh, thank the organization, of course. I will do that later a bit more. But uh, let's say already on this stage, I would like to thank uh, Daniela and Noortje. I really think that they did a marvelous job. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it's imp also always important to have the glue in a meeting like this. And I think you, both of you were that. Um, but it's also great to host so, so many people here. Uh, I think this was our very first, what is it, MedTech Day? But I can already announce that we also have, will have a second one. So uh, I would also like to invite you all to that uh, second one. I am sorry, my oration will not be part of that one because I can only do that once. But if there's anybody in the audience still needing to do an oration, then please step forward. We can always integrate it in the program. Um, uh, what else, I guess, yeah, the next point of the agenda is, uh, is my oration for which I will heartedly like to invite all of you. Uh, for now, there will be yeah, a bit more than an hour of uh, sort of break. And uh, yeah, as I said, I think it's a nice moment to enjoy coffee, to have uh, more discussion, and specifically to look at the posters. For now, I want to thank you for your presence and already thank you uh, in advance for the next one. Huh? Thank you.